Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio where it's time for part two of our HO scale Christmas layout build, the Santa Fe and St. Nick. Back in part one, we built some basic bench work uh, with a folding table stand, a frame made from some one by fours, and a deck made from Thermax two inch thick gold insulation foam. As you can see, we've come a ways since then. And this episode is all about terrain, track and trains. We're going to put together this loop of Cato Unitrack and then build all of this southwestern scenery up from the same extruded gold foam we used for the layout deck. But before we jump into all that, let me explain a little bit about the design choices that I've made here. I find it desirable on a small layout like this to not be able to see the whole thing at once, to have some of the track be hidden from view so it doesn't look as small as it actually is. And for that reason, I've employed the age old trick of a scenic divider. These buttes, these rock formations, these mesas block the view from the front side of the layout to the back side of the layout. So you actually have to walk all the way around to see the whole thing. But enough theory. Christmas is just around the corner and I've got a lot to show you here to get you caught up, so let's get started. I chose rugged and reliable HO scale Cato Unitrack for this project because it's readily available, it's easy to use, and it has a built-in road bed that's going to have us up and running trains in no time. Here's a list of the Cato track pieces and other materials I'll be using today. And I'll also put this list in the video description down below and a link to where you can find this stuff. Right off the bat, you'll notice that Cato uses millimeters for their track measurement rather than imperial units, but please don't let that scare you off. Uh, the track is manufactured in Japan and it is simply the best uh, integrated roadbed track system on the market. The cost might seem a little high up front, but with proper care, this stuff will give you decades worth of hassle-free operation. You may notice that I've listed uh, two different sizes of curved sections, uh, some 550 millimeter radius curves and some 430 millimeter radius curves. That might seem like overkill on such a small layout, but there is a method to my madness. Using the wider 550 millimeter radius curves as a transition between the straight sections of track and the sharper 430 millimeter sections creates what's known as a spiral easement. A spiral easement is when a curve starts out broad and gets sharper as it goes around. In a loop like this, it gets broader again as it goes back into the straight section. This is preferable because going directly from a straight section into these sharper curves can cause some equipment to derail. It's a little bit of extra work, but will lead to much smoother operations down the line. Putting Cato Unitrack together is very easy. The flexible plastic clips below the metal rail joiners lock the pieces together, making for a strong physical and electrical connection. One of the 246 millimeter straight pieces has a wire with a plug coming out the back of it. This is the electrical feeder track. The plug hooks up to a standard Cato power pack and that's what we'll be using to power the layout. They usually come in blue, but I've painted mine flat black because, well, I like the look better. I'm placing the feeder track near this corner since that's close to where the power pack will be. And now I can quickly assemble the rest of the track loop. So, starting with the two 246 millimeter straight sections, then I'll add one of the 550 millimeter radius curved pieces, and then six of the 430 millimeter sections. One, two, And that goes back into another 550 millimeter radius piece. And by the way, if you ever get confused about what track sizes are what, just look on the back. It's actually stamped on the back of each piece right around the middle there. See, so it says 246 right there. S246, that means straight 246 millimeter. And that's what comes next. Two of those pieces on this side. And then it's the same thing again. 
to the other end of the loop. Okay, now I want to make sure that the track loop is properly positioned, you know, centered on the foam deck because in the next step I'm going to be outlining all of the track with a sharpie. I'm doing this because then I'll be able to remove the track completely and work on the foam terrain without making too big of a mess of things. I'm tracing around both sides of the roadbed so I'll know uh, exactly where to put terrain so I'll have plenty of clearance on each side. Now I've started by sculpting the edges of the layout into a rock face. And the tools I'm using for this, basically just a coping saw, a uh, utility knife with a sharp blade in it, and a wire brush, and some sandpaper. This is some uh, 180 grit sandpaper. And just kind of going all the way around and making this look like a rock face. And <laughs> this is where things start to get really, really messy. Uh, so you also want to have a shop vac standing by because you're going to be doing a lot of cleanup as you go. First, I'm going to use the coping saw just to come in and cut out some rough, rocky shapes. Remember this. Uh, foam board hangs over two inches above the frame so I can go back in uh, quite a ways here to create that rocky look. And then I'm going to come back with my utility knife, refine that a little bit. Don't be afraid to break it off. Uh, breaks always look more natural than cuts because that's what rocks do in nature. They break. I'm trying to simulate the look of southwestern sandstone here. Then you can take your sandpaper, smooth it off in some areas, and then double it over like that. You can add um, horizontal lines like this, kind of going down, delineating rock layers, and uh, vertical lines too where water might erode the stone away and run off. Then once I'm happy with the general shape of that, I'm going to come back with a brush, a wire brush. This one actually has nylon bristles in it. This is the softest one I could find. So you want to use a, a, a soft wire brush just to get some strata lines in there, make it look like sandstone. And now I want to take my shop vac and clean all this up, get all the bits of dust and foam off of here. It's on to the next section. Decided I want to put a bridge over here, so I'm using a SureForm tool to remove larger amounts of the foam, create a bit of a depression right here. Have a little wash or creek coming down through here. I have the remaining pieces that we cut off the 4x8 sheet of extruded gold foam when we built the deck for the layout, and as you can see, I've already removed the uh, foil wrapping from both sides. So now I can start building up the landforms, the terrain, with some blocks of roughly cut foam. Now what I really need to cut out shapes like this is a keyhole saw. The glue I'm using to hold the pieces of foam together is this Loctite premium construction adhesive. Now over in this corner I want to have a short tunnel so I'm going to cut and stack layers of foam until I get to the height that I need.
sometimes I like to use these uh, bamboo skewers to hold the layers of foam together while the glue sets up. Usually I want to leave access for the interior of a tunnel like this, but this one is so short that I really don't think it's going to be an issue. Yeah, I can get in there pretty well from either end. We've got to have a few balancing rocks here in the southwest, right? Up on the top of this tunnel, I want to have like a classic southwestern mesa. So you usually have a slope like this, a talus slope. And I created this just by using the wire brush and, you know, going down at an angle all the way around. And then you've got cap rock up on top. Then I like to go around and add smaller rocks here and there made out of the uh, scraps of foam left over. I should probably mention that the tunnel portals I've been using over here are from a company called Model Dynamics. They're resin castings, but you can use any tunnel portals, any HO scale tunnel portals for something like this, where I'm using it as a uh, height and width gauge to make sure there's plenty of clearance for the trains in my tunnel. For this big butte, I want sort of a Monument Valley look. And all of the finer lines and details in here are actually just carved with a pencil. This uh, foam is soft enough that you can just go in and, you know, carve it right away with the lead of a pencil. Really easy. Now I want to make a little rock cut over here. To disguise where the power pack is going to be. Now that the rock carving is complete, I want to make a paste to fill in all of these cracks and crevices in between the layers of foam to make it look more natural. And to make that, we're just going to use some water, some white glue, and some chunks of the leftover foam. Like everything else so far, this is going to be fairly messy, so be prepared. I'm starting with a container with about a quarter cup of water in it, and then I'm just going to grab some chunks of foam and start grating it into this and I'm just going to keep grating these chunks with my sure form tool until I've got it almost full to the top stir it occasionally to get that stuff wet now I'm going to add a whole bunch of white glue to this going to take a lot of glue uh, to make this work the way it should. Much more glue than water. Now the idea here is to take this goop and work it back into these cracks to smooth the transition between the different layers of foam. Once this is dry, it'll dry exactly the same shade and color. I'm not going to do every single layer. I, I do like the cracks in some places, but uh, just in more obvious spots like this. Well, I think that's pretty good. 
Besides, I'm fresh out of goop. I'm going to let all this dry overnight, do some cleanup, <laughs> come back tomorrow, and we'll get a coat of some earth-toned paint on here, make it look a little bit more like Arizona and less like mashed potatoes. Okay, it is painting day, and I am excited to get the first base coat of paint on this scenery because that's going to seal this foam and cut way down on all that dust I've been dealing with for the past couple of days. First and foremost, we have our paint. This is uh, interior household latex paint, matte finish, and this is a color known as raw sienna, which is a nice base coat for Arizona, Utah type red rock scenery. Got some uh, solo cups to uh, pour paint into to make it easier. Got uh, some water here to wash brushes in. Got my uh, one inch filbert brush, which is my favorite paint brush for painting scenery with. Been using it for years. Roll of paper towels, very handy. I think I'll start right over here on this corner. Not going to be doing anything fancy today. My only goal really is to get a nice even coat of paint on all of this scenery that we just made. I added just a little bit of water to this to thin it out. And that's going to help it to uh, get back into all of those cracks and crevices, those nooks and crannies that are carved into the foam rocks. And I know what you're thinking. Some of you. You're saying that doesn't look like snow. Well, you're absolutely right. It doesn't look like snow. Our goal here eventually is a red rock winter wonderland. But first, we've got to paint the rock. And then, just like in nature, the snow is going to go on top of that. So, first things first. Okay, now I just need to let this dry for a few hours, and then it will be time to reinstall the track. Start with the power feeder track. Now I can install the controller. Turn the plug up through here. Plug it into the power pack. Then bring the main power cord up through this other hole. And plug it into the jack there. Now all I need is a train to run. This is a sound-equipped Bachmann 440, one of their sound value series. It's a DCC locomotive, uh, and it's kind of overkill for this layout because we're going to be using standard analog DC and not digital command control. But the nice thing about these Bachmann locomotives is they can operate on both kinds of systems. So we're going to be running it on this layout. Um, it's lettered for the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. And it is just perfect for the time period that we're modeling. I don't really have the uh, Santa Fe coaches yet that I want to use on this layout. They're on their way and should be here in a few days. So right now I'll substitute this V&T coach. And we'll take her out for a spin. Well, not too bad right out of the box. She's got a little bit of a hitch in her giddy up. Um, there might need to be some adjustments made in the quartering on the drivers, but other than that, not bad at all. And that should bring us right up to date with the Santa Fe and St. Nick so far. 
I hope you'll like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you won't miss the next episode. And that's where we're going to be finishing off the painting of this scenery and starting to add some snow. So I hope you'll be around for that. You can also follow Thunder Mesa over on Instagram at thunder.mesa and see what's new on the Thunder Mesa Studio website at thundermesa.studio. And if you really enjoy what we're doing here at the channel and would like to show your support, you can do what these great folks did and go over to patreon.com slash thundermesa and show your support there. Until next time, keep moving forward, my friends. Happy holidays. Adios for now.